Hello, good morning, everybody. I think it would be time to start. Thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, and welcome to the Sunway University ESAP Symposium. This morning, I will be talking about ideas versus ideology. And the reason why I'm doing that is because the theme of the conference is sustainable learning. And one way to achieve sustainable learning, I believe, if we teach our students how to be independent and autonomous learners. For this, we need to move beyond the traditional functional literacy, which requires the learners to decode letters and understand messages. And we need to look into critical literacy. We need to teach our learners how to read a text and try to understand how the text is manipulating the reader or trying to promote a particular view of the world. So this is why we need to look into and differentiate between ideas and ideologies. Okay. In the opening plenary, Dr. George was talking about Einstein, right? So I will also show you now a letter about Einstein. That was this, this letter that made its round around the, the internet a few years ago, which was sent to Einstein by the University of Bern. Okay, have a look at this letter and tell me if you think you see something suspicious about it. Okay, you can raise your hand and then you will then be unmuted so that you can share your views with us. Okay, I give you two minutes to do that. You can also share your thoughts into the chat box. Suryati, would you like to say something? No, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Drum is there. So, anybody? Then, how about I, I, I try to walk you through this letter? Okay. Uh, the first thing that I noticed when I saw this image is the language of the letter. The language is English and it seems a little bit interesting that the correspondence between the German-speaking Einstein and the University of Bern from Switzerland would be in English and not in German, which would be natural to both uh, people. But even if, 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 if so, and if they choose to use English, then the titles in the letter would be interesting because they are talking about the position of an associate professor. Okay, now, interestingly, the associate professor title is, is common in the English speaking world, but not in the German speaking world. So that title would be probably Privat Dozent if they talk about that. Another thing that is interesting to us is the logo, uh, the, the header of the letter which shows the University of Bern uh, logo. Now, actually, the University of Bern logo is, is different from that. OK, it, it's a completely different design. This particular logo is very similar to a university's logo in Budapest, the University of uh, uh, Economics. OK, so that that makes it very suspicious. And the last thing that I noticed about this letter is the stamp 
of the University of Bern, which is very similar to the coat of arms of Hungary. And so there's the Privatdozent, as you can see that. This is the logo of the University Universitat Bern and not the University of Bern. And here you can see the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. And finally, that's the coat of arms of Hungary. So I think that this letter was probably uh, forged in Hungary. I didn't do it, I, I swear, it was by someone else. Uh, probably some university students. So clearly this text was created with the intent of deception. Now let me show you another text. This text summarizes the difference between a PhD and an ED, a Doctor of Education. And somehow the screen has disappeared. So let me just get it back quickly. Okay, so if you look at this, um, let me just very quickly go back to where we were. So it lists different strengths of a PhD and a doctorate in education program. Now this text tries to inform, it doesn't try to deceive you, okay? But even by doing so, it may not give the information that is accurate. If you look at the, the text, first of all, it says that a doctorate in education is applying research to practice, right? Are they trying to say that anyone who is doing a PhD research is not doing that? PhD research is highly theoretical and not practical. I doubt it would be the case. They also say, and now I have to somehow move this banner because it's blocking my screen. So it also says that, um, PhD promotes an advanced theory on a topic, as if a doctorate in education would not do that. It also says that it is ideal for um, for working professionals. I'm not quite sure whether you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? No. No. OK, somehow it has been taken over by someone else. So let, let me go back. And go back to the to the screen, OK? So it's for working professionals, uh, people who do a PhD will become experts. And people who do a doctorate in education become leaders. But if you do a doctorate in education, it does not guarantee that you become an educational leader. Okay, So this text, again, does not present completely true information. Okay, And this is why we need to look into critical reading skills and understanding how a text is trying to manipulate us. Even worse are texts that try to convey some ideology or they are based on some ideology, okay? Because then they are promoting a particular view. But before we, we get into that, before we, we, we look at what ideology is, let me ask you what you think about ideology, okay? So let me open up. this screen. 
okay, where you can give me your ideas about either you you can't can you can you see the screen again this this some way screen came back i'm a little bit confused now how much we're seeing ideology is yes okay so at the top of the screen you can see a website mentimeter okay i would like you to go in there and type in the code and give me three words that you think represents the meaning of ideology. Okay, can you do that? So what is ideology? You just go to www.menti.com and use the code 840100. Ah, words are coming. It's a belief, it's influence, it's a system. Any more words? Ah, it's a system, people's opinion, an idea. Mm -hmm. As you are entering the words into the system, it will rearrange the word cloud based on how many people are using a particular word. So belief seems to be a strong word, opinion, ideology is ideology. That's cute. Mm. Ideology is an idea, system, personal belief, politics. Oh, that's an interesting word, politics being there, a thought. And still words are coming in. Principles, perception. I like the word being powerful. Hmm. Personal belief. Let's see if any more words are coming in. Okay. I, th I, th I think we, we've got a good idea about what uh, ideology might be, according to you. So it's it's a belief, you say. It's something to do with politics. It, it, it can be powerful, people's opinion, um, thoughts, ideas. Actually, it's a little bit more than that. Let me let me stop sharing that and go back to the PowerPoint that we have at hand and look at some definition of ideology from the literature. And I think this is important because it will take us to uh, textbooks. So here's a definition by Chappelle and Fairclough, and they say that ideology is a system of ideas. We have system in the word cloud values and beliefs oriented to explaining given political order. Again, there was a word in the word cloud about political order, legitimizing existing hierarchies and power relations and preserving group identities. There's another definition by Kurt Christiansen and Benninger, where they say that ideology is the dominant political, educational or cultural value system that secures its legitimacy through institutionally circulated discourses. Now, this is a key point for us, institutionally circulated discourses. So ideology represents the powerful, ideology represents the thoughts of a system and it helps maintaining that system status quo. This is opposed to an idea. 
an idea where an understanding thought or picture comes to the mind, a belief and an opinion. And we as educators, we have to help learners to come up with their own ideas rather than parrot or echo an ideology that a powerful party is trying to uh, show them. Okay. Now, what does it have to do with teaching materials? Because the talk should be on teaching materials. Uh, the institutional circular discourses that that Kurt uh, Christiansen and Wayne I was talking about are dominant in textbooks because textbooks are usually controlled by the state. So if you look at it, a textbook is basically not just a collection of language teaching ideas or activities. A textbook is a message in a bottle. A textbook is a carrier of culture. A textbook is a snapshot of a society at a particular time and space. And as such, these materials are carriers of culture and may support a hidden curriculum. So they may support a hidden curriculum which is influenced by the ideology of that particular society. In some cases, they are actually not that hidden. Let me show you an extract from the Chinese uh, National Curriculum Guidelines. This says that English teaching materials should involve moral education. They should be conducive to students' development of a correct view of life and value orientation. Now, you may ask, who is the one who defines what is a correct view of life? What is correct? Who decides what values students should have? Okay, so this is why English teaching materials can be tricky because they can contain ideological bias. Let me show you an extract from an English language textbook that was printed in the Chinese context. In the chat box, maybe you can add your thoughts of how this particular example is representing a bias or some ideology. Okay, let me give you like one minute for that to see what comes up there. Thank you to Professor Stephen Hall saying that only women can milk cows. That's uh, very constructive. But as, as many people say, they, this represents the particular gender roles. As you can see, uh, women roles are in farming or in uh, being a shopkeeper, whereas men can be builders, policemen, truck drivers, or doctors. Uh, in this particular textbook and, 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 and quite a few other textbooks, it is very interesting that gender stereotypes are ingrained in, in the language the book is using. For example, when they, when they talk about a, a doctor who happens to be a woman, they feel the need to put in front of the title female. So they, 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 they differentiate between a doctor and a female doctor or a lawyer and a female lawyer saying that lawyers usually come from one particular gender. Okay, this happens very early on. This happens in primary uh, school textbooks. This happens in secondary school textbooks. There are also political bias and political gender. What I'm going to show you now is again from a Chinese language textbook. This is the, the new college English textbook. The activity that the students have to do is read the humorous story for fun. 
I'll give you a few seconds to skim it through. So what do you think? This comes from a published educational material. So it's about Hitler and Goebbels talking about killing 14 million Jews. It's not just politically incorrect and highly insensitive. But in an educationally uh, oriented context, it's also questionable in terms of methodology. There, there, there's no task, there, there's nothing to do. Um, it seems that the textbook editors are having a good laugh at the expense of genocide. It's interesting to note that a few pages later in the book, they talk about the atrocities during the Second World War and the Nanking massacre, and they are saying that uh, Japan has to pay a price for the, for the atrocities they committed against the Chinese population during the Second World War. So in a way, they talk about two equally horrible events, but when that event happens far away, then it just becomes a humorous story. When the event is close to the heart and close to home, then it becomes a horrible thing that happened. Okay? So this is how ideology is, is represented in, in textbooks. So it's hidden there. We need to use our critical skills to dig out what the text says and how it tries to influence people. Okay? I would like to give you a task now. Um, you probably received a handout at the beginning of uh, when you registered for the workshop. And that handout contains extracts from a Malaysia printed textbook, the pre Moet uh, textbook, from a particular unit which is titled uh, Unity in Diversity. If you have that handout with you right now, I would like you to look at the, the book, look at the material and try to see anything that could be questionable from an ideological point of view. Now, some people are asking handout, what handout? Um, I think if you registered for the workshop, you must have received the handout. If not, then, oh, more people are saying I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to be then a problem. In that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen and I will try to go through the text with you. Nobody seemed to got the handout. OK, uh, that's interesting. Then let me let me share the handout with you right now. Okay, sorry about this glitch. Um, I stopped this presentation and I will share the handout with you. Okay, can you see that? Okay, can you see the handout? I am running in the dark here, but I suppose you can see the handout, right? Um, so in this handout, uh, what you can see is, 
a text and I highlighted some parts of this text. So the, the, the title of this unit is Unity in Diversity. And the first section that I highlighted here, two texts side by side or, or one below the other, it says that Malaysians must do uh, build a robust national unity by preserving and protecting its many diverse religious festivals and customs. Okay, preserving and protecting. This is part and parcel of our shared broader goal of achieving integration and national unity. This is absolutely perfect. Okay, that there's nothing wrong with that. Later on, however, in the text, they say that narrower communal objectives should always come second because the interest of the country should be first. And again, many might agree with that. However, if we go down to the second text here, it's a very interesting little text. I, I highlighted a, a couple of things and what I would like you to do now in about one or two minutes to look at it and to think about why I highlighted those bits. So I'm going to be quiet for a few minutes. And I let you think about the text. If you have some ideas, you can immediately share them in the chat box. Another option of sharing your ideas is going to a Padlet that I have created. You need, I just shared the link in the chat box, and the password that you need to use is Symposium 2020. This Padlet will be up even after the end of the symposium. And then, if you would like, we can we can carry out the discussion in that format. Are there any ideas? What can be wrong with this particular section that I highlighted? I think this is this is one of the problems with virtual education and, and, and virtual conferences. Sometimes the the presenter is feeling that uh, he's flying blind because uh, there seems to be no reaction from the participants. I I don't see anybody's faces because most people are not turning on their cameras. I don't hear anybody, and uh, and the. Um, the chat box is chat box is empty. So sometimes it's it, it's a bit disheartening 
that you don't get any response. But I, I know US teachers all know that because uh, things are, are coming up. OK, so the question again. So look at this text and see what's happening there. OK. Check out your pad. Yes, yes, I have seen that. So that's what I'm going to share now. So text two is quite balanced, showcases diverse community in the area. Some of the dominant specific words are from one particular culture. Three major races. Racial profiling. OK, interesting that Mohiba equates to only the three races, but no mention about indigenous groups of Sabah and Sarawak. Very true. Any more comments coming? Yeah, some other people are also mentioning the the lack of indigenous people in other parts of Malaysia. Some more comments are coming in. We have some very interesting comments coming in through Padlet. couple of people are agreeing, but we don't really know what they are agreeing to, as their comment is not attached to any of the other comments, but that's all right. Maybe as you are typing, or some of you are still typing, um, maybe we can talk through the problems in this particular text. What I noticed is that the only non-English words were Bahasa Malaysia, Malamuhiba and Bajukurung. But there's also Halal, but Halal is an Arabic word, of course, used in the Malaysian context a lot. So to me, the text reads as if it would try to introduce the non-Malay, non-Muslim community to the Malay culture, to the Muslim culture. Uh, this is what the first green underlining in the text shows. Uh, they are saying that the program started at 8 p.m. out of respect for the prayer times of the Muslim community. In other words, what they are trying to do is they are trying to teach a non-Muslim audience about the importance of prayer time, the importance of respecting Muslim traditions. Also, if, if, if you look at how the the students are presented. 
or how the children are presented. They say that there was a Chinese girl in Baju Kurung. So it gives the specific name of the Malay dress. Whereas the Chinese boy was dressed up as a king doing an Indian dance. So the textbook writers were, were not really concerned about giving a name to the Indian costume, just like they did not name the Chinese fan dance in the Chinese name. So the text seems to be loaded with the ideology that tries to achieve um, racial integration. But racial integration in this sense is more like racial education or educating the non-Malay community to how they should behave or how they should uh, live in this multicultural, multiracial society. We did a research project on this with, with Hazel and Rimba. Uh, and one of the things that came out of the, the project, we asked teachers how they use the textbook. And one of the, uh, actually many, many of the answers were saying that the unit is simply just boring because it's repeating what they hear on a day-to-day -day basis from many other sources. The, the teachers did not like, did, did not see any problems with the language of the textbook, which indicates that the teachers that we were working with probably lacked uh, a critical stance to look at their own materials. Because what needs to be done is take the material and try to add other activities or offer the students a chance to think about the issues that are presented in the text. Now, if you were teaching this particular textbook, what kind of materials, what kind of other activities would you do keeping the same text as it is to help your students understand that there are certain ideologies hidden in the in the material. Maybe you can share your ideas in the comments section. So what can you do as a teacher with such an ideologically loaded material? Let's just wait for some answers there. Any comments? Anybody like to, to share ideas? Oh, somebody saying that Redrawing the government mandated racial outline might get you in trouble. Not necessarily, I think. Um, you, are not, you are not promoting something against the government. You are raising awareness of the very intricate racial and cultural fabric of Malaysia. I mean, imagine if people are using this textbook in, in Sabah and Sarawak. There are many indigenous people in those, those, those states and they are left out. So imagine how the students in those areas will, will feel when they only learn that in, in Malaysia there are only Malays, Indians and Chinese. Um, ask students to investigate the names for the general terms. That's a brilliant idea. Um, because what, what you could do is you can get your students to, to do some uh, research. You can get your students to list, for example, 
all the different cultures and people who live in their area. So localizing the textbook material, but not changing it. And what other cultures, what other peoples live in their uh, in the neighborhood? Okay. What other ideas? There are many other things that you can do. You, you can, if, if you are teaching in a primary school, well, this particular material is not for primary school, I know, but you can ask the students to draw. You can ask the students to uh, illustrate the text with the different uh, ethnic costumes and name them. You can also ask them to describe a festival, describe a different uh, street party than uh, what is presented in the book. You can also ask the students to use uh, different languages within the English language classroom, as these are languages which are which are common to their own cultural heritage and interest. I think we are running out of time, but I think we still have time for questions. Um, I, before we get to the question part, I, I would like to apologize the technical glitches. Uh, I, I, I was hoping that this session would be a little bit more interactive, but somehow you plan and technology rules and takes over. So any questions you would like to share? Maybe, maybe we can do that through orally. So if you raise your hand, then uh, Vivian can unmute you. Hi, Dr. Thomas. Perhaps we can just take in one to two more questions. Okay. Okay, so anybody who would like to ask questions, please raise your hand. Or type into the chat box. If there are no questions, then I think what we can do is just rush to the very end of the slides and I can share my email address with you. Again, I have to go through the whole set of slides, unfortunately. Apologies for that. There you can see my email address. And if you have any questions, then I'm very happy to answer those questions. I cannot give you a lifetime guarantee that also George did, but uh, I will answer questions for, for a while. Okay, so thank you for coming to this session and participating. And I think it would be now time for you to go for the closing plenary of Prof. Stephen Hall. Okay, thank you for being here and enjoy the closing plenary. Okay, bye bye.